This morning we'll look at suffering. We'll ask the question, what happens when suffering stays? We'll consider Job chapter 7 verses 1 through 7 and we'll ask, why does suffering come? What do we do when it does? Grace, mercy, and peace be yours today from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'll read the seventh verse of Job chapter 7 as we begin today. It's a part of a prayer that Job speaks to God this morning. Remember, O God, that my life is but a breath. My eyes will never see happiness again. The family went to church one Sunday morning and on the way home, they stopped at the drugstore to pick up the Sunday paper. When they drove down the street to their house, they saw all the fire vehicles, smoke. The fire was out, but when they reached their house, they discovered that their gas water heater had blown up and the house had burned down. They walked through the wreckage, the rubble of their home, crying, not understanding how or why something like that could happen. A man lies in the ICU of a hospital. He's been there. Days have turned into weeks and weeks have turned into months. And he begins to wonder, why, Lord? I'm not getting any better. I'm in tremendous pain. I'm ready, Lord, to, to go whenever you're ready to take me. But God seems to linger, not take him home. A woman sits in a doctor's office stunned, numb, unable to talk because the word she feared was the word that she heard from the doctor that morning. She had cancer. Things go through her mind. Emotions cloud her. Tears start coming down. What's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to my family? Those are very real issues that we run into regularly in this life. Either you know people that have had terrible issues or long-term suffering, or maybe you yourself have had it as you face some of those issues and others that we endure in this world. It's all there. And we can certainly empathize with people going through that. It seems like those of us who have been wounded make the best caregivers because God has enabled us a special insight into the pain and the suffering of other people. There's all kinds of suffering in this world and you and I probably at one time or another when trouble has come into our lives ask the question why? Or why me? But there doesn't seem to be an answer does there? We might struggle, we might search, we don't really know God's plan in this purpose, in this suffering. And so we trust in God who knows what's best for us, even in the midst of hardship. Job, in our lesson today, is not a stranger to that kind of suffering. And in fact, if we think of all the different types of suffering in the world, Job endured it all, didn't he? We know the story of Job. Satan appears before God in heaven, points out Job, asks God if he might have permission to try him, and God says, so far, but no farther. God does the same with every temptation and trial, hardship and suffering that enters our lives as well, because our God is a gracious God who loves us. And he puts limits on Satan in all the difficulties that we encounter. Job, as you recall, one day had a series of messengers coming with bad news. He was a wealthy man, had large herds, tremendous number of servants to care for those herds, a good-sized family, and one after another, robbers, bandits, fire, his whole vast holdings were wiped out in a day. And then News of a terrible storm where all ten of his children were gathered in one of their homes and the storm caused the house to collapse and kill them all. Financial ruin, emotionally distraught. And the scripture says that Job 
shaved his head, knelt down before God, and worshipped, and worshipped. The scripture says that Job was blameless and an upright man in God's sight. Why are all these things happening to Job? It just doesn't, in our human perspective, seem fair at all. But that wasn't the end of it, was it? There was more to come. Job's health failed him as well. He had blisters, open sores, scabbing over, festering pus. He itched so terribly. We think it might have been a leprosy of some kind. He took broken pots and he scraped his skin to stop the itching for just a brief moment. He was in misery. He laid there all night thinking about how long until morning. And then he struggled all day long. And then to add to all of the pain and suffering that Job has, his dear wife, who has not complained all this time, who took it with him graciously, quietly, finally reaches her breaking point when she sees him failing. And distraught, she says, why don't you just give up your integrity, curse God and die? Adding again to the burden of his suffering. Why, Job asks, why? It's like watching a swimmer, isn't it? In the ocean, working hard to go through the swells and reach the shore on the far side. Sometimes you see him riding the curve or the waves and his arms going, but sometimes he's down underneath. The waves have come over and he's struggling and struggling and then he's popped up on the surface again and down, down he goes. In our life, sometimes, like Job's, stronger at moments, weaker at moments, maybe filled with hope, suddenly in despair, back and forth we go. Why does God allow suffering to enter our lives? God has a purpose and a plan. And this morning, as we look into this little section of the, gospel, or the, uh, the book of Job in chapter 7, we see Job at one of his weak points. It says in, in those verses, and this is Job speaking again, doesn't man have hard service on earth? It's like military service he's talking about here. Are not his days like those of a hired man? Like a slave longing for the evening shadows or a laborer waiting eagerly for wages. But Job's suffering wasn't that temporary, was it? So I have been allotted months of futility. Nights of misery have been assigned to me. When I lie down, I think, how long before I get up? The night drags on and I toss till dawn. We've had those nights. <laughs> My body is clothed with worms and scabs. Maggots are eating at his sores. My skin is broken and festering. And then he turns to God. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and they come to an end without hope. Remember, O oh God, that my life is but a breath. My eyes will never see happiness again. There's Job at his lowest moments. There's Job in despair. Lord, remember me. Have you ever had that prayer? I bet we all have had it one time or another. Lord, remember me. Where are you, Lord? I know you're there. I know you care for me. I know you love me. But where are you? Have you forgotten me? The answer for the children of God is no. I have not forgotten you. Because you see, in all of Job's suffering, God had a divine plan. God's plan was not to torture Job. God's plan, unlike his friends who said, God has punished you, you for some unrighteousness that you've done, we know that God does not punish individual sins. He's punished Christ in our behalf. So, what is God doing? We're reminded in the Hebrews that God chastens those he loves. 
What is God doing? God has not revealed his plan to Job and he doesn't reveal his plan to us, but he has a plan for our glory. When Satan tries to drive us from God, God uses that to drive us to our knees so that we look to him. And as we look to him as children of God through faith in Christ, looking upward, he reaches down and by his grace and mercy, when the time is right, he lifts us back up and fills us with hope and with joy. Because God's desire is not that we writhe in pain. God takes no pleasure in that. But that we should be transformed through hardship and suffering into the people that he desires we should be. Now that doesn't always sink in. That doesn't seem right to our human mind. But think of it this way. Look at the cocoon of a butterfly. The caterpillar spins that cocoon and leaves just the tiniest little opening at the top. And then when the metamorphosis has taken place, that little butterfly begins the process of squeezing itself through a lot of hardship and struggle and hours of work through that tiny little hole. Now, if there were you or I sitting there, we might think, well, that's an awful thing, right? Let's take a little pair of clippers and open that up just a tiny bit so that that butterfly can emerge with less effort. And if you would ever do that, you would see that butterfly come out, but he would be all bloated and his wings would be all shriveled. And if we waited and watched that butterfly expecting that his body would slim down and those wings would fold out into the beautiful rainbow that butterflies have and that he would take flight and fly away, we would be sadly disappointed. Why? Because God uses the struggle and the hardship and the suffering of that butterfly moving through that tiny little hole to force all of the fluids out of that butterfly's body and out into its wings. So that when it does emerge after its trial and tribulation, that it can stretch out its wings and they will dry. And then it can take flight and fly away. But without the hardship and the suffering, that butterfly would not become a butterfly. And the same is true for you and I. We are going to have times when we suffer. There are going to be times when we don't understand what it's all about. But we have the assurance of God's love through it all. And when we turn to God, and when we allow the scripture to lift our eyes to him, we understand that by the struggle and the hardship of us going through those tiny little holes in our cocoons, you and I become the beautiful creatures of God that he would have us be. Because it's through your times of hardship and struggle that you take on the image of Christ who lived in this world, who faced suffering and rejection and hardship for us who exchanged his crown for a cross, who exchanged our sin for his righteousness, that in him we might be the righteousness of God and that he might be the propitiation, the offering for our sins. And as his disciples, we follow him. And so, how do we look at suffering? We look at suffering as a temporary difficulty on the way to a greater glory. And you are the person today, you are, because of the hardships you have had. You may not be overwhelmed all at the same time with financial crisis, emotional crisis, physical crisis, and a crumbling situation in your home. Maybe you have one of those now. Maybe you've had one in the past. But God will carry you through them because God allows hardship and perseverance grows and perseverance develops 
the God-like character. And that character is going to produce in you hope. And the hope that God gives you will never disappoint you. So troubles will come, Jesus promises, in this world, in this broken and sinful world. Broken and sinful people are going to have problems. We are going to struggle. But he also promises that he will be there to embrace us, to hold us up when they come. Because you and I are the baptized children of God. And God's people are not hopeless. They are hopeful. And he promises to turn our struggles into joy. In the end, Job was blessed. God blessed him beyond the measure of blessing he had had before. And God does the same to you. For God prepares you through suffering for a greater glory. Do you remember what Job finally said in chapter 19? We use it, don't we? Every Easter, it's in a hymn. I know that my Redeemer lives. And on the last day, I will stand upon the earth. Even after my skin is destroyed, I myself will stand there and behold him with my own eyes and not another's. I know that my Redeemer lives. That is something that can give you the hope in the midst of sorrow that will keep your eyes on Christ and the promise of sins forgiven and eternal life to come. Just picture the butterfly and how God is working to give you those beautiful wings. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'd like to hear more on this or any other topic, please find us on the web at emmanuelnrh.net. Please join us for worship Sunday mornings at 9 a.m., Bible class and Sunday school at 10.30 a.m.